Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing today? Good. Wonderful? Good. Excited? Good. About what? <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, so. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, it's a both way win win. <laughs> So I'm Kamlesh Ravlani, um, come from Phoenix, bright, sunny Phoenix, Arizona uh, in USA. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, is your organization ready to scale Agile? Um, how many of you are practitioners, particularly in the scaled uh, domain? Work with large programs, multiple teams, or use some type of framework? Wonderful. Keep your hands up. Yeah. Wonderful. How many of you are, you are certified? Please raise, keep your hands up if you are certified in some type of scale framework. Some type of, okay, wonderful. And uh, how about rest of you guys who are totally new to scaling? Okay, wonderful. And how many of you who are new to scaling are in some type of leadership, managerial positions? Okay, wonderful. So the idea, is that we're going to discuss how you evaluate whether your organization is ready to scale or not, or do you really need it? So question one is, why scale? What is, what is the need to scale within your division, group, organization, or a, you know, a business unit, wherever you are? What's the need to scale? Is it because everybody else is doing it? Let's do it. Is it a, you know, a latest buzzword? You know, CEO, CIO heard somewhere at the uh, golf uh, uh, with their peers, colleagues, and they said, well, they are doing it, let's do it too. So how would we take a minute, write down A, what is the need uh, within your, your context? If you work with a company, great, you have very specific context. If you are a consultant, you know, coach, or kind of a trainer, you work with multi, uh, multiple organizations, they may be asking you to bring your expertise or knowledge about scaling. So take a minute, write down, what's the need? What's your vision about it? Please. Yeah, write down on a paper, that's okay. You don't need sticky for this. And if I could request you, both of you, to please join one of the team, that would be great. Does anyone here not know what do I mean by scaling, agile? Or n have no idea about it? I, I was wondering if you have a common definition. Okay, that. wonderful. <laughs> sure. Now, scaling might mean different for different people, uh, different organization, based on their need and context. But if you are looking at large programs which need more hands to work on, more people to work on, than a standard scrum team that we identify, maximum nine people. If your team has like 25 or maybe 50 or maybe 500, then you need some way to identify how is this gonna work because your team cannot be ideally more than nine people, yeah? Or if you have large program that needs to be delivered within certain time frame, again, you would need multiple modules being developed at the same time. I was in, a, uh, in an environment where we had an existing legacy product which had to be revamped and redesigned, rewrote, uh, and this was used in educational field. And millions of students, school districts were using this program to administer uh, some exams for the students. Which means that all of the functionality which the current product has, the new product must have, or ideally should have, and most likely, or preferably, it, it should have some additional features as well. Uh, because this, we are saying, well, we are launching new products, so it should have some new features as well. Now, there's a timeline that uh, this product must be released uh, within that, so that it can meet uh, the timeline when the school districts actually make their purchasing decisions, buying decisions about these programs. That means that we had to use more number of team members on the team identify different modules which could be developed simultaneously. Is it a fair, uh, good start, starting point? Thank you. 
So I believe by now you have some idea about, you know, why your organization wants to scale. Yeah. It's important to have a clear vision, um, specific goals or benefits that you're looking for, um, and whether those benefits will be met uh, by you adopting some type of scaling framework. And context is king within your organization. Each organization have different uh, opportunities, strengths, and constraints in how these organizations work. So what do we do with the context? Who has the context? Who has the context? People working on, uh, in the organization, on teams. And what do you do with that? What do you do with the context that you have? Set the context. Set the context. <laughs> well, so you, you initiate or you facilitate interaction among these people for them to discuss the context because those people know the context and for them to bring up the context, you as a leader need to facilitate that conversation for them to bring those things up and discuss that based on these things, how we go about it. So the goal for me here today is to discuss some of the scaling factors that I have found very useful for us to consider. Um, please hear me correctly. That these are the factors that we have found, I have found useful for me to have conversation within the teams. This is not a checklist kind of a thing. But these are not the only factors. You might have different factors that you f might, may find more beneficial or useful or more contextual to your need. Okay? But I fairly find that these have consistently helped me initiate good conversations with the teams. Organizational culture. How is organization doing what they are doing? How are things done? How are decisions being made? Whether through a bright ideas win or people with the loudest, you know, um, who can shout the loudest, they get the funding or they get their ideas uh, accepted. How are, how's the hiring going on? All these decisions that teams or organizations make are driven by the culture. So how is the culture within this organization? Sorry. And the organizational structure. Yesterday you heard some conversations about organizations that are more of hierarchical command and control of a triangular shape versus organizations which are more newer, lean, they are more flatter. There are more, uh, you know, uh, empowerment within the teams. There are less hierarchies that people have for their reporting. And that really empowers people at the front take the ownership, be self-organized. Also, it, it helps, facilitates the information flow, rapid information flow from the front to the top. So if the person who's developing your program and the person who's reporting the final results to the Wall Street or, you know, the, the Lal Street here. How many lines of uh, organizational barriers are there between these people? Organizational structures. Now, the more the barriers, more the silos you will see. More the silos you see, more the competition will, will you see among these silos. Where, I'll give you an example. I was with a um, large... Uh, financial organization. And uh, the team that was developing, maintaining, and uh, uh, helping develop this uh, software programs, applications, uh, were reporting to directors. Directors were reporting to VPs. And these VPs were reporting to the presidents in one you know, uh, technical organization. And there were business teams, product owners, who were reporting to their product directors product VPs and their presidents. 
Now, both these leaders have their own priorities. They have their own needs. Now, they, though they are both working together, their teams are working together, at the end of the day, who wants the credit when the product gets deployed? Who? Both, both right? Yes. What they did is, after they identified that in a newer way of working, we would have to break down these organizational silos for people to collaborate and people to collaborate, share information, not withhold that, they would have to eventually report to one leader. They would have to have common shared understanding and common goals. So with the organization structural changes, they've identified one president where all these, both of these VPs would report. Now the sooner it happened, the conversations changed. Now from us and you, to it became Okay, what's our goal? What are we trying to accomplish? What you know, uh, percentage share we want to grow um, in the consumer sector, in the corporate sector? What is our business volume that's going to look like? And how are we going to accomplish it? Which product or initiative are we going to fund? So now these were common conversations. It helped it being from you and I, or we versus you, to being us in there. These structural changes changed the way teams were looking at the things, where there was a tension between, you know, who's eventually going to get the credit to now, okay, how are we going to meet that goal? Structural changes as well as cultural changes, I have found myself that they work very, they are interconnected. You can influence culture by changing your organization structure and vice versa your organizational culture could also help you arrive at the right organi organization structure. How about we take five minutes on your tables and write down how the organizational culture and the structure impacts you. What are the factors within those that are important for you? Please discuss on your team, you have five minutes. You have two more minutes. For the culture, for the structure. Uh, were you guys able to identify some factors? Yes, everyone, all the teams? Is any team that was not able to identify even one factor? All right. So those of you who just joined, please join a team and you can um, have the conversation among you. So they will also give some context. Yes. Okay, let's move on. The third factor, all right, if all of us can have attention, please. Thank you. So I'm sure all of us know this. When the facilitator raised the hand, we all stop doing what we are doing. We complete the sentence that we are, if we are talking, and raise the hand. Yes? See, let, let's see if we can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great groups I have found uh, achieving consistently uh, all the hands up within seven seconds. Uh, let's see if we can break that record <laughs> consistently. <laughs> all right, so the next factor. We found that very important for scaling conversation is leadership agility. Are the leaders thinking lean? Do the people at top have that mindset already? Do they know the stuff themselves and practice it, what they are expecting their people to be doing? Does that reflect in their actions when they hire, when they make decisions? Right? when they you know, um, 
let people uh, do certain things or uh, initiate some initiatives. Are these are the pilots in the cockpit all well trained, or do you have untrained pilots in the cockpit who all of you in the organization are trusting? Very frequently, uh, the leader, leaders, uh, clients that I talk to, uh, leaders bring up this conversation that, oh yeah, we, we all understand Agile and we have been doing the daily scrums and our teams are great at the sprints, uh, but we have X, Y, and Z problems. And the teams have a similar opinion. That, oh yeah, we all, we all get this, but our leaders don't get this. Our leaders are still asking us to do those same things. They are still behaving in that same way. So how is leadership within your organization impacting the decision to scale? How big of the programs that your organization is carrying out and how many you know, people are supporting that organization? Do you have people micromanaging teams? Do you have each person being held or being directed by somebody else at the top? Or are people allowed to self-organize? Are the managers doing a job of helping people grow, helping people learn, rather than making decisions on their behalf? Next is the product ownership. In the organizations, uh, frequently uh, I find this, um, and uh, I say this, that when I talk to organizations, uh, leaders, they say, we have no PO, VPO, IPO, no PO. What I mean by that is when we talk to them and say, okay, who's your PO? Like, oh, we don't have a PO. I'm like, no, you must have a PO if you're doing a Scrum. Product owner is the first thing that you need. Oh yeah, yeah, we all do that. You know, we all write the requirements and you know, we all make the decisions. So from no PO, the conversation changes to VPO. I'm like, no, but somebody should be there who makes those decisions. Then the conversation changes. Oh yeah, that I do that. I, I am the one who makes those decisions. So from VPO, the, ch the conversation changes to IPO. And then the conversation happens that, well, do you have that product domain expertise? Do you talk to the customer? Oh, I don't talk to the customers. So who talks to the customers? Oh, nobody's talking to the customers. So again, the conversations come back to no PO. Having strong product ownership within the organization is key to success, whether you are doing it at a team level or at a scaled level, or multiple teams, large programs, or small uh, products. Having strong product owners who have great dom uh, domain knowledge, um, who have availability for the teams, um, and also they have authority. They have authority to say no to things that they think are not providing value to the organization or will not have any value uh, for the customers. They are in touch with the customers. Even if you move, your teams uh, have the greatest processes, engineering practices, and they move from releasing every year to re releasing every single day. But what's the benefit when your product owner is not showing that product to the customer and getting early feedback? That's the key. So having a strong product owner and the responsibilities that the product owner should uh, have is a key to scaling. Now also product owner is responsible to own and manage something called product backlog. backlog. Yes. Having a well-groomed, ordered, and appropriately described a product backlog is a key for any team to scale or accelerate their value delivery. A lot of times we find that when the teams get together, uh, even if it is either single team or multiple teams, the product backlog is not really sprint ready. What I mean by not sprint ready is there are dependencies which were never discussed. Now the team members pick it up and it's like, whoa, we need that service for us to write this code. 
and like, okay, who owns that service? Oh, we don't own that service. Somebody else owns it. So when will they do it? Oh, we don't know. We'll have to talk to them. Can they do it now? They'll say, oh, it depends. You know, they have other things that they are working on. Yes, please. When, when you talk of product ownership, you're talking about end to end, right? Help me understand what you mean by end to end. I mean for the. Example, for example, let's say for the web-based application. Sure. You know, a a, a web-based application that's got a front end, a, a back office, a server component to it, and several components that requires multi skills to get <coughs> it. If, if, uh, uh, the product ownership that you're talking about is really the end to end portion of it. Right? Because often, I, I don't want to jump the gun. Please. Please. Go ahead. So ideally, you shouldn't even have component level ownership of product. So, so, so you're talking end to end? Yes. Um, if somebody else owns a middle layer and somebody else owns your back end, that's like an organizational dysfunction. That you can trace back to the, how the organiza organization is structured. Right. Yeah? All right. So we were talking about the product backlog. Having a great product backlog, which is ready, sprint ready, is ordered all the time. Uh, also, one thing that a uh, lot of teams face is they go to the sprint and there's a number of items in the backlog and like, okay, which ones we pick? Which ones are higher priority? The answer is all of them. We want all of them, right? So it doesn't matter. All of these are higher priority. So the conversation is not about which ones are priority, but in what order do we pick them? When the product owner says that all of these are priority, it tells us that they haven't gone through that exercise where they have identified that which item is most valuable to me today. And that's an exercise your Scrum Master could help facilitate or coach the product owner to go through before the sprint begins. In fact, sprint planning begins. So that the product owner comes to the sprint planning with a product backlog which is ordered. So there is an explicit understanding among everybody, shared understanding, that item on the top is the first thing that we got to pick. So there, there has to be no conversation about which one would we pick now, unless team finds that, you know, first one is something that, uh, you know, we can't do now, but how would we start with the second one? Yes? So are you saying that if the product owner says that all are priority, that means he has not done the work? Looks like it. Yeah. It, it could be the case. case. Well, that's, instead of you challenging them during the sprint planning, that's a scrum master who should, who should make this as a point to work with the product owner before the sprint planning, when they are refining the product backlog continuously. So if you uh, go through the scrum guide, scrum master has three core responsibilities. One is towards the team, which you know, most of you are familiar with. Uh, but the uh, scrum master also has responsibility towards the product owner and the organization, which in many times we find is missing because the Scrum Master has either multiple teams that they are working on, or they are also being asked to you know, write code or do other things. And so their focus only remains working with the team, but not these parts. So coming to that point, if product owner is not doing that, that would be Scrum Master who could facilitate that. So if he says that all are priority and you just ask him to choose, so he'll just put a number saying that, okay, these are in the order of you pick up. I wouldn't say it's difficult to prioritize. I would say they haven't gone through that exercise of identifying what's really valuable for me to do. Yes. Sure. Yes. Thank you. So the question is, if the product owner comes to the sprint planning and they say, you know, all of these are priority for me. What is the, what is the inter, uh, interpretation for that? So it's not because it's hard, but it's because they haven't probably gone through that exercise of evaluating the value. What's the business value for us of doing that thing? 
Yes. Sure, uh, great point. point. Thanks for sharing. So her point is, uh, it could be the product owner's old uh, traditional mindset where if they say this is priority, the things that they called as lower priority may not even you know um, get implemented. So that could be the fear in the mind of the product owner. Yes, please. Uh, I just seen uh, something different was priority when it comes to the features. Most of the videos are pretty much aligned with the priority. This is what I need. This is what I don't need. I mean, maybe I need it later. But then it comes to taking your intake or the defects, they say fix it all. That's where you know, they don't want to step into the drive. And have you seen any similar stuff from that? Yes, so the question is. Do you guys have a mic? So the question is, uh, when there is a defects in the product backlog, usually the product owner is not willing to take responsibility of ordering them. And then they would say, well, that's your thing. Go ahead and fix all of those. Right? So give you a ex uh, real life example from my work. I was on a large program where, um, I think 2008 or nine. Um, there were teams, teams working on code, teams testing, and all those. So these, obviously dysfunctional, uh, this testing team would have a daily phone call with the product owner to go over the number of defects that they found to A, identify which were the valid defects, B, which one would be higher priority for a team to pick it up now. So to your point, that's an organizational dysfunction. Why is the team having defects, which they have to go through, obviously, later? If the teams are working in silos, then yes, th it will happen. But, but if your uh, dev and the test and all those team members are working together, fixing the defects when they find it within the sprint. Yes, I mean, uh, we do that. We have kind of a zero defect policy. If you are developing a story or something and you identify a defect on that, so we don't close it until all the defects, doesn't matter which severity it is, one to four maybe, but until we uh, fix all the defects, we don't close the story. But sometimes we have defects from the previous work, right? We have legacy code, so the products are there uh, since 20, 30 years, we, mm. we deal in mainframe. Sure. So we keep getting those defects. So product owner could, in that case, work with, so his question is if there are defects from the legacy code which has existed for 20, 30 years, how do we you know, um, handle those? So your product owner, when they work with the team to refine the product backlog, uh, this is a conversation that should happen at that time. That, okay, we have some defects, and obviously they are not uh, from right now, but obviously from you know, um, maybe 10 years ago, uh, code that was written, but we found now, what do we do about it? So then you put that in a backlog and work with the team to identify that how severe it is, whether we should handle it now or can it wait? If it has waited for 10 years, can it wait for two more sprints? That could be the conversation. Uh, that, that's really logical, I mean, uh, that makes sense. And everybody knows it, that, but I was telling some behavior, sometimes we see the product owners that they don't want to step in and prioritizing the defects. They're sure. more interested in the features, so especially the stories. So, so that brings us yeah. back to the strong product ownership. If they do not want to own the backlog, that's a dysfunction in there. Uh, yeah. I have a question. Okay, I'll come to you. Yeah. Uh, the subject Wait, is... Wait, please. The subject of this wait. topic, uh, the, the topic is actually, is your organization ready for scaling Please wait, Agile? please wait. 
but uh, we are still talking about the basics. I'm a bit worried. I Yes. It's already half an hour, more than half an hour. So uh, you have four more minutes to write down some factors for leadership agility and the product ownership. You have 30 more seconds. to scale is the practices that you follow. Now, some of you might be in software using Scrum, XP practices. Some of you might be using Kanban or any other practices, processes, frameworks that you follow. How good are you with those? We start doing Scrum because you know we find Kanban more easier or because we were not able to do it properly. We were not able to complete the sprint with what we planned and deliver that. Or did our delivery was not really potentially shippable because we didn't do the performance testing and the security testing and the integration and all those things. So evaluate within your context, with your teams, that how could have we adapted the process that we have chosen Two, if it is engineering practice, are you doing continuous integration correctly? Um, are you able to deploy frequently, get feedback early? Are you doing peer program? Now, if you are doing scale, if you want to scale from you know, seven people to 700 or even 70, it's critical that the code that is being written is really a quality code. How many of you think that the code that your teams write is a great quality code, goes to next level without any defects. The, the, the developers are doing the automated unit testing and they are identifying defects early, fixing those, you know, doing refactoring time to time. Yes, some yes, some kind of yes and no. <laughs> yes, so th these are critical practices. If you are scaling, you are working with a lot of other issues like code merges, um, integration testing, system testing, um, and all the ability, ability kind of uh, things that uh, your product must satisfy. And if these things are not automated, if these things are not automated, there are good chances that your scaling effort may not be effective you will only find frustration when you see five teams throwing buggy code at the end of the iteration. L let us keep going here. Uh, last factor is the quality. So if there are defects that you are finding after the sprint is over or towards the last days of the sprint where there are silos within the team, or the quality is an afterthought. You are actually getting the testing team members on the team only when you know, certain things have already happened on the project or a product um, you know, increment. That could be a sign of the dysfunction. The quality is not an afterthought, but has to be brought in when your product is being planned or it is being you know, uh, designed. At, architectural level or at the uh, early stages. When the 
product owner is thinking about a product, writing the description or acceptance criteria, your testing team members are part of that discussion. The testing team members are not given a list of requirements which they would read and then you know test the code. So see how good your teams are with the thought process of quality. So again, let's take five minutes um, and discuss what factors apply to your conversations within your teams um, about the practices, processes that you follow, automation, what level of automation you have already accomplished, how far you are there, and the quality. You have five minutes to do that. And after this, we may have your team come up and share what are your findings with the rest of the groups here. areas that are relevant to your teams, how about we identify that now how, what you do with these? So an easy way I have found uh, for teams to have this conversation is through a metaphor of the transformation that a caterpillar goes, th caterpillar goes through. How many of you don't know this transformation? Can I see hands if you don't know about this transformation? Okay, I'll be happy to explain. So when the butterfly lays eggs, the egg turns into a caterpillar. Um, so it's already a living being and I'm sure <laughs> your organization at least do something right today. So I, haven't, I have omitted the egg part. <laughs> so what I would do is, if I think that automating the testing is critical for us to scale, if that's our, my team's understanding, we discuss that how would we rate ourselves on this transformation that a caterpillar goes through. Are we at an infant stage here, growing obviously, or are we into this chrysalis state where the caterpillar is ready to transform into a butterfly. And the next stage is obviously it's about to you know, shed its uh, chrysalis state and become a butterfly that has wet wings and is not uh, already flying, but it's kind of getting ready there. And then you have a stage where there is an adult butterfly that flies and you know, people like it. Uh, if you've been to Diana's session yesterday uh, in the Agile fluency model, you have different levels which we identified through uh, stars that how many stars your organization has uh, based on certain criteria. So here, this different metaphor, sure, this is not a maturity model. This is not a maturity model. This is also not a evaluation criteria or a checklist I'm giving it to you. What I'm trying to do here is help you <coughs> initiate conversations within your teams. That what is important for us if we want to scale? And what you need to do is have these conversations within your teams. So this was like a mock dry run for you guys, identifying certain factors and having conversations that within that factor, what is important for us? And you, you would do same with your teams, identify what is critical for the team. You would not be creating an Excel spreadsheet based on what you discussed today and saying, okay, let's put a check mark against each item that we, we do it or not. 
this helps you to initiate that conversation. And once you have those factors that you think that these are critical for us, you evaluate yourself. How are we doing on these factors? Are we already flying? Or are we yet to transform ourselves? We need more of that. And that helps you bring next, level, next discussion in the context of, OK, what we want to do about it. Yes? Uh, I guess some of the uh, participants were expecting that I would talk about the SAFE framework. I would pu put a big picture here and explain how would you scale Agile. Uh, but that's not the point for this conversation. Hope all of you are on the same page, those who are in the room. All right. So what I would invite you, encourage you, to make it your own. Identify, I, show, I showed six factors which I found useful. Identify what factors you find is uh, useful for you. Maybe these or maybe some different. Add some more or remove some if you think that these are not important for you. Create that uh, environment for you to have that conversation. Identify those factors. And then take it from there. Also, if you had a conversation with one team or one division, doesn't mean that that same conversation applies to your other division within the same organization as well, because their context changes. Jeff Sutherland says, context is something that you need to look out for. Scaling process is not something that you should be looking for. With that, thank you. I'm open for questions. Yes. Scrum Master is a critical role for teams following Scrum. Agree? Not every team is following Scrum. Teams who are primarily in software, they are either Scrum or Kanban. But you could have teams which have no relation with the Scrum Master role. Like you have all DBAs in a team. What do you want to do about it? So what I have covered is the process area. What are your practices that you need to look out for? If you are the Scrum shop or the Scrum team, and the practice obviously calls out for the Scrum master, then you would discuss about the Scrum master role in there. But if you're doing Kanban, you don't have any Scrum master, that's OK. You identify within Kanban what is useful for you. Then your conversation changes to you know cycle time and how frequently we are able to deploy. Yes. Yes. Uh, please speak louder. We have a mic. Yeah. Okay. Here. So we spoke about automation. Yes. Right. There are a number of cases where uh, one automation is more expensive than manual testing in many cases. Sure. So organization deliberates whether to invest in automation or go with, with manual. Second is the reusability of automation. We spoke about automation during development. So when I automate as part of my development cycle, so when will I reuse it? So after I, you know, I automate it, I run it once, then I get that gets scrapped because in the following sprint I do further enhancements, develop new user stories, so the automated scripts are no longer valid. So I keep automating. I run once, and I just throw it and again automate. So when we talk about automation, so should we not also look at return on investment? Sure. Um, and I can give you an example from uh, Google. I, I was recently talking with someone. And uh, the Google's code, overall code, uh, changes every month by 33%. And there are multiple deployments in production that happen every day. Um, and each, each of the deployment goes through millions of tests. So it depends on your need or the product that you're working on. If you are, you are developing uh, like a mobile um, iPhone game <coughs> that has like five levels, does it make sense to automate your testing? may not be, um, as you're saying, right? It may not give you the return on investment. But if you have a product, like you have a mature 
um, like a travel site or a banking website or any of that kind of insurance um, applications, if your product is going to exist or has existed for long and is going to exist, um, most of the organizations I work with have found value in automating. In fact, a lot of organizations stop funding an initiative that is spending money on manual testing. They would not fund that initiative. Yes, any other questions? Contracts. So customer contracts are something that impact scalability within the team, which is a big factor because uh, your team might want to scale, but the customer contract So, so, so that, that you, you can, can relate back, back to the culture of the organization and the structure of the organization that how is your organization serving the customers. Today's organizations, newer, um, in the newer way of work, organizations are collaborating with the customer to the level that they have customer with them and they are co-creating the product. They are not getting some written documents from them and then based on that they develop the product and send back, but they are working with the customer hand in hand to identify what hypothesis is correct. They are learning from their hypothesis and incrementally developing the product. So in that case, if you were, again, thinking back, saying, okay, would I be doing a fixed contract or a time and material contract, um, see how would that conversation change when your customer is with you, they don't have the requirements up front, and you guys are working together on quickly iterating. So what you're saying is gets factored into the first two factors. Yes. But if the organizational culture is to, you know, uh, a top-down approach where certain people from, you know, marketing or leadership, they go and commit to the client and say, oh, well, this is what we, our team is going to deliver and pick up the contract, sign some, you know, numbers on it and say, now, okay, go figure out, do it. That's how the culture in the organization works. And that, that's not conducive to what we are talking here. Yes, any last question? No? If not, uh, thank you for uh, your time and I appreciate it. Thank you.